Um, I'm Michael Barr. I'm the Joan and Sanford Weill Dean of the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I'm really delighted to welcome you all here um, for our City Foundation lecture and policy talks at the Ford School event today uh, featuring Tom Khalil. In 2000, the City Foundation, through a generous endowed gift, established the City Foundation lecture series. The lecture series honoring President Ford's long affiliation with Citigroup brings prominent policymakers from the national and international arenas to the Ford School each year to engage students and faculty in dialogue and to give a public address. Tom Khalil is one of our country's leading experts on technology and innovation policy, and it's an honor to have him here with us today. Tom served in the Clinton administration as the deputy assistant to the president for technology and economic policy while doing double duty as the deputy director of the White House National Economic Council, working on technology and communications issues and nanotechnology initiatives. He continued his role at the forefront of science technology under President Obama as the deputy director for policy for the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, working on initiatives across the range of uh, the White House um, activities from learning technology, data science, robotics, to STEM education. In that uh, role and in these roles and in his other parts of his career, um, Tom serves as a role model for an advocate of scientific advancement. Uh, let me take a, a moment to mention um, many of you in this room are part of uh, the Ford School of Science and Technology and Public Policy program. Um, this is a program that really um, takes on the ability to um, help provide our students and our faculty with the tools to analyze complex uh, science and technology policy issues uh, deeply connected to Tom's um, career uh, and his, I think, distinguished career that I've just given you little highlights of um, today at his request um, uh, suggests the advancement, um, the ways in which uh, science policy uh, really needs to be brought into um, this broader um, realm of social science, um, ethics, values, public policy, and economics. Um, today, uh, Tom is continuing that work in the private sphere as the Chief Innovation Officer at Schmidt Futures, uh, an exciting new philanthropy that uh, Tom will undoubtedly uh, mention. Uh, let me just say a word about format. Um, we're going to have some time toward the end from questions for the audience, or as Tom said, maybe closer to the beginning um, for questions from the audience. I'm so happy to um, engage with that. Uh, we have uh, Joy uh, Rohde here, who's the uh, Ford School Associate Professor and Interim Director of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program. Uh, two Ford School students, Celine Seja and Carl Hetchy, who will sift through your question cards and pose them to our guest. Uh, for those of you who are watching online, um, please uh, tweet your questions using the hashtag policytalks. Uh, now it is my great pleasure um, to welcome Tom Khalil to the podium. Um, Tom, I turn it over to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Is everyone fired up and ready to go? All right. Um, so uh, it's, it's great to be here in, in Arbor. And uh, Dean Barr, thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, my father would have been proud and my mother would have believed it. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk about uh, my experience in the uh, working for the Obama administration uh, in the area of uh, science and technology policy and give you some examples of both uh, specific initiatives uh, that President Obama was involved in, uh, in launching uh, uh, and reflect on some general lessons learned uh, from that experience. And then I want to make sure that we have uh, plenty of time for, uh, for questions. So uh, just to say a little bit about uh, how I wound up uh, as an advisor uh, to, uh, to President Obama and uh, President Clinton, um, the, uh, it was really all a, a path-dependent consequence of a decision I made in 1987 uh, to volunteer on the uh, Dukakis for President campaign. Um, so I wound up working in the issues department, uh, which is sort of like boot camp for people who want to work on public policy uh, because uh, what would routinely happen is that you're given some very short period of time 
uh, from a few hours to, if you're lucky, a couple of days to try to get up to speed uh, rapidly on some public policy issue uh, and then figure out what is the one to two pages that you think the candidate really needs in order to be able to understand the issue. And believe it or not, this was pre-Google, you know, so dinosaurs <laughs> were still roaming the earth, so we actually had to call people on the phone. Uh, and if you're running the, if you're in the issues department of a campaign, it means that you're responsible for coming up with new ideas so that the candidate can say, if elected, I will do X, Y, and Z. We had to come up with the X, Y, and Z um, <clears throat> to manage networks of outside advisors uh, so that if some question came up that we'd be, we have, there was someone that we'd be able to turn to, uh, to get the candidate ready for debates, uh, to ensure that they are familiar with the issues that they're going to, that voters are going to be asking them as they travel around the country. Uh, so uh, in 1988, they would get, uh, the candidates would get questions of, about the auto industry if they went to Michigan or the semiconductor industry, they, w they went to Northern California. Um, trying to ensure that the, uh, the campaign ads were at least reasonably accurate. Uh, and, uh, uh, and also we would get flooded with questionnaires uh, by every interest group under the sun. So we, could, we would have to figure out which of them we were actually going to answer and which we were just going to punt on. So um, what you learn how to do is not become an expert in anything, but uh, you, what you learn how to do is just rapidly get up to speed so that you're at least conversant on the issue in, in the amount of time that you have. So uh, I did that in 88. In 92, I uh, went down to uh, Little Rock and wrote a number of Bill Clinton's uh, position papers uh, and then uh, got a job working for uh, Bill Clinton on the National Economic Council and got a chance to work with uh, Michael Barr when he was also at the NEC in the, in the 90s as we refer to them those dark days of peace and prosperity. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> um, when I worked for the Office of Science and Technology Policy, uh, the main thing that I did was to build a team. Uh, so uh, this, is, uh, this is the uh, folks that I uh, recruited to the uh, White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, right next to me is was my boss, uh, John Holdren, who is the president's uh, science advisor. Uh, and uh, one of the people that I recruited is University of M Michigan's very own Sridhar Kota, who uh, helped to lead uh, a number of our initiatives in the area of advanced manufacturing. So uh, I don't expect you to be able to see all this, uh, but this gives you a sense for the structure of the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Uh, we had <coughs> five major divisions. Uh, so one that I led focused on tech and innovation. We had a US CTO that was focused uh, on things like uh, digital services uh, being developed by the United States government, um, a group working on national security and international affairs. So the, the link between S&T and, and national security issues, things like cybersecurity. Uh, and then uh, a group uh, focused on, on energy environment. And overall, the role of OSTP uh, was to work on both science and technology for policy and policy for science and technology. So let me say a little bit about what the distinction between those two is. So if the president and his or her senior advisors are making a decision uh, that has a scientific and technical component, our job was to make sure that he was getting the best possible advice. So um, when Fukushima occurred, he would want to know what are the implications of this, not only for the people of Japan, but what are the implications of this for the United States? Or uh, if the, uh, you know, there was a year when uh, the flu vaccine was singularly ineffective. Uh, and so the question he asked was, how do we ensure that we do better in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, in years to come? So that, that sort of science and technology for policy, how do we make sure that the president has the best possible advice? And then policy for science and technology, which is what I'm going to spend the majority of my time talking about, uh, things like how much should the federal government be investing in research and development? 
How do we encourage more young boys and girls to excel in STEM? How do we create an environment uh, that is, uh, fosters innovation and promotes not only the formation of companies, but the rapid growth of those companies in the United States? So uh, this, is, uh, th this is the president giving his inaugural address. Uh, and one of the things that he said that we were, of course, very happy with is the notion that we're going to restore science to its rightful place. And in part, uh, that was because uh, there was uh, a certain level of friction uh, between uh, the, the Bush administration um, and uh, the scientific community. And that arose from a couple reasons. Uh, and one was this notion of scientific integrity. Uh, and in particular, uh, when the scientists would say things like um, about climate change that were not consistent with the administration's policy, uh, there were certainly instances in which they were being discouraged from talking to the press uh, or that um, people in the White House were changing the conclusions of scientific reports before they were being issued to the public. And the, the concern on the part of the scientific community was not, well, on any public policy issue, just listen to the scientists and do whatever they say, um, that, you know, because public policy involves juggling lots of considerations. But you should at least make sure that, um, that the the you know consensus or the the views of the scientific community are are being fairly and accurately represented as part of the policy process. Um, so this was uh, something that the uh, president uh, very soon on uh, uh, taking office elevated the role of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and uh, signed a executive order on uh, on scientific integrity. So. I'm going to talk primarily about uh, a, uh, some of the elements of a, a framework for the administration's policies, uh, particularly in, in tech and innovation, um, that fall under the rubric of the uh, President's Strategy for American Innovation, which is a document that he released in 2009 and then updated in both 2011 and 2012. And there are three. Uh, uh, broad areas where he thought that there was an important role for the government. One was for the government to invest in the building blocks of long-term economic growth and, and job creation, uh, particularly around human capital, uh, scientific research, and, uh, and 21st century infrastructure. The second was to create the environment for private sector innovation because <laughs> after all, it's companies that uh, produce uh, commercial products and services. And the third is the role that innovation can play in helping to achieve a broad range of national goals like allowing Americans to lead longer, healthier lives uh, or accelerating the transition to a low carbon economy. So this last part of uh, catalyzing breakthroughs for national parties attempts to answer the question, innovation for what? Uh, so what are the uh, major challenges uh, that the United States face, that the world faces, where we think science and technology can make an important role. Um, and so what I'm going to do for the remainder of my talk is to give you some examples, concrete examples of things that we launched that, uh, to advance this uh, initiative. So um, one of the things that the president uh, said is uh, if you win the NCAA or the Super Bowl, you get to come to the White House, the same thing should be true uh, if you win a science fair or robotics competition. Um, the, uh, uh, this was one of the president's uh, favorite events of, of the year. Uh, uh, he had an opportunity to meet with amazing students every year. Um, I remember one year he met with a 16-year-old girl who was already uh, doing research on functionalized gold nanoparticles to attack uh, tumors while leaving healthy cells untouched. And it you know, made the rest of us feel like slackers because <laughs> at 16, I, I was playing Dungeons and Dragons rather than working on a cure for cancer. Uh, and here he is with Joey, who has developed this marshmallow cannon 
<laughs> and the Secret Service has explicitly told him not to fire it. Uh, and, but the president comes up and, and he says, he asks Joey, well, does this work? <laughs> and so like the, the kid is torn because you know, the president of the United States is asking him to like fire this thing, uh, much to the delight of the, uh, of the Secret Service. Um, so this was one of the mechanisms that the president used to highlight the importance of STEM education and to inspire more young people to uh, excel in STEM. Um, towards the end of the administration, um, he launched an initiative called Computer Science for All, which is uh, making computer science and computational thinking a new basic at the K through 12 level. <clears throat> One of the challenges uh, in this area is uh, that in other countries, uh, there is someone called a minister of education uh, who can just do this. Right? So in Japan, the Minister of Education can say, computer science is going to become a new basic in the K-12 curriculum. In the United States, we have 15,000 school districts. Uh, so in order to make progress in this, <coughs> there was no one we could call. Uh, we literally had to build a movement around this that involved governors, mayors, high-tech companies, um, uh, schools of education, nonprofit organizations. Uh, in, or, in, order, in order to make progress on this. Uh, another thing that, that we worked on was uh, with the deans of engineering was something called the Grand Challenge Scholars Program. Um, so this is a program that, uh, in which undergraduate engineering students uh, can organize their coursework, uh, research service learning, international activities and entrepreneurial activities around one of the 14 uh, grand challenges identified by uh, the National Academy of Engineering. Um, we also, uh, in uh, obviously improving STEM education requires uh, increasing the number and quality of STEM teachers. So we had an effort uh, called uh, 100K and 10, uh, which was an effort to prepare 100,000 high quality math and science teachers over the next 10 years. And, and this is a goal that we're on track to meet. Um, and then we launched a series of <coughs> research initiatives. And uh, <coughs> one area that a lot of campuses, including the University of Michigan, are moving in the direction of is uh, data science. Um, and so this is an effort that we launched in, uh, in 2012, um, really looking at how we could go from data to knowledge to action. So how do we go from having you know, huge amounts of data to deriving insights uh, from that data and then taking at some action uh, based on that. Um, in uh, April of 2013, uh, President Obama uh, launched something called the Brain Initiative. Um, this was an effort to do for neuroscience what the uh, Human Genome Project did for genetics. Uh, so one of the questions that I would ask people in the research community uh, and other stakeholders is in the same way that President Kennedy uh, decided that we should put astronauts on the moon and have them safely returned by the end of the decade, what are the similarly ambitious goals that we should set in the 21st century? And a foundation uh, had pulled together a multidisciplinary group of faculty in neuroscience, uh, nanoscience, and synthetic biology and one of the ideas that grew out of that workshop was, uh, what if we made an investment in tools that would allow us to understand the brain in action? So that would uh, increase our ability to understand how the brain encodes and processes information, and ultimately could lead to new tools that improve our ability to diagnose, treat, and prevent diseases of the brain, and to lead to new uh, computational architectures and algorithms that are informed by how the brain works. So, you know, at current trajectories, supercomputers will require their own dedicated power plant. Um, the human brain only uses 20 watts. Uh, so Mother Nature has figured out something really important about low power computation uh, that, that uh, engineers and computer scientists can learn a lot from. Um, and if you look at the advances that have been made in the area of machine learning, uh, many of these work by training an algorithm, 
uh, by providing it with sometimes literally millions of examples. Uh, and obviously, that's not how a toddler learns. Uh, if a you know, toddler burns their finger on the stove, you know, they, don't have to they don't have to repeat that uh, a million times. Uh, and so uh, obviously there's a lot more that we can learn uh, from how uh, the human brain works that could inform the next generation of computer architectures and, and algorithms. Uh, so this enjoyed really strong bipartisan support and Congress passed a law as, as part of the 21st Century Cures Act that for the NIH component of, of this initiative, it also involves NSF and, and DARPA and IARPA, but for the NIH component provides 10 years of funding, uh, which is very unusual because usually they only provide uh, uh, one year of support at a time. Um, the, uh, this is the National Robotics Initiative that uh, President Obama announced in uh, uh, 2011. Um, in particular, uh, looking at opportunities for uh, human-robot uh, interaction. So what can teams of humans and robots do that neither can do individually? Um, we got a shout out for the Materials Genome Initiative from a, a University of Michigan student here. This was also announced in 2011, and this is aimed at uh, reducing the time uh, required to develop new materials. So it can take as long as 17 to 20 years to go from discovery to high volume manufacturing of new materials. Um, and I believe uh, materials innovation deserves a lot more attention uh, than it gets. If you think about it, entire epochs of human civilization are named after the material system they used from the Iron Age to the Bronze Age to the, to the Iron Age to now we're you know, living in the silicon age. Um, and a lot of the things that we need to do in the area of clean energy, um, the ab ability to generate energy, the ability to transmit energy, the ability to use energy are going to uh, require materials innovation. And so this was an effort to figure out how to use new computational tools and informatics and machine learning to reduce the time required to develop new materials by at least 50%. Um, one of the areas that I got really interested in uh, was uh, this idea of incentive prizes. And in the, in the late 90s, um, I read a book called Longitude, uh, which is about how the British, because the, the British Navy was losing all these ships, uh, had a 25,000 pound prize back when that was real money in the 1700s. Um, and uh, to develop a solution for more accurate uh, measurement of longitude. When I worked for President Clinton, I was able to get a uh, DARPA prize authority, which they used for self-driving car competition. Um, the, um, the second time they ran this competition, um, a, a team from Stanford won, and uh, Larry Page was at the finish line, and he promptly acquired the winning team. Uh, <laughs> so this is the, this is the origin of uh, uh, Waymo, the, uh, the, the alphabet uh, self-driving car effort. So when I came back into government, um, I was able, for, for working for President Obama, I was able to work with Congress to pass legislation uh, that gives all agencies the ability to support incentive prizes for up to $50 million. $50 million. And if you go to challenge.gov, you'll see over 800 instances in which agencies have used this. Um, and we referred to this as, uh, as building on the insight from Bill Joy, uh, who used to say, no matter who you are, most of the smartest people work for someone else. Um, so if you're a government agency, you, you want lots of people to know what problems you're trying to solve and have an ability to contribute to them. And one of my favorite examples of this is that the Air Force was interested in solving the following problem, which is, Imagine that you have a vehicle approaching a military checkpoint uh, and the, the vehicle is not slowing down like it's supposed to. You would like the vehicle to stop without damaging the vehicle or the occupant. So they put this problem out there and the winning idea came from a retired mechanical engineer from Lima, Peru. Uh, and the, the Air Force only spent $25,000 on this challenge. Now, had they used a traditional procurement uh, process, 
I guarantee you they would have spent a lot more than $25,000. They might not have gotten an answer and they certainly would not have gotten an answer uh, from a mechanical engineer from Lima, Peru. So this is not a substitute for other ways of supporting innovation, uh, but I think it is a really interesting uh, tool and the toolkit that we should have for, for promoting innovation. Um, we did uh, a fair amount in the area of commercial space um, and there was a program that was very successful, um, which was that uh, the United States retired the space shuttle uh, because NASA could no longer certify its safety. Uh, at that point, uh, NASA had to spend a large amount of money uh, with the uh, Russian government in order to get a ticket for a US astronaut on the Soyuz rocket to go up to the space station. Um, and there was an understandable interest in having a US alternative. So what NASA did was to partner with companies like SpaceX and, and they, to their credit, they, they didn't say, you know, here's the rocket that we want you to build. They said, this is what we want you to do. We want a rocket that will go up to the International Space Station, deliver and retrie retrieve cargo and ultimately astronauts. But exactly how to do that is up to you. Um, and uh, so as a result, they wound up uh, for an investment of $400 million getting what would have probably cost two to $4 billion using a more traditional approach. Um, so the United States went from being a, uh, you know, a laggard in the, in the area of the, the uh, space launch industry to, to one of the leaders as a result of uh, partnering with commercial firms uh, such as SpaceX. Um, we were also interested in making it easier for immigrant entrepreneurs who wanted to come to the United States uh, and start businesses uh, to do so. Uh, we tried to work with Congress to pass uh, comprehensive immigration reform uh, legislation, which would have included something called the startup visa. Uh, we're not able to do that. So this is something that uh, we were able to get done through uh, executive action. Um, uh, we uh, worked with Congress on legislation to allow equity-based crowdfunding. So a lot of you are primarily, are probably familiar with donation-based crowdfunding where you might contribute to someone's Kickstarter campaign. This was an effort to extend that to equity-based crowdfunding and also to make it easier for small companies to raise capital and, and go public uh, without having to comply with all the regulations that may be appropriate for larger companies but may not make sense for, for small companies. Um, some of you may recall that the, uh, we had a less than successful launch of healthcare.gov um, so what happened after that is that um, the administration recruited people with technical skills uh, to uh, come to, to drop everything else that they were doing and work almost around the clock uh, until it was up and running again. Uh, and the president uh, appropriately asked, uh, why don't we have these people involved at the beginning of a project? Uh, <clears throat> and uh, so we were able to convince a number of the people that had fixed healthcare.gov to stay uh, and they launched something called the U.S. Digital Service, which is um, uh, something that the, the current administration has, uh, is continuing to support. Um, a project that um, <clears throat> Schmidt Futures is supporting is uh, something called Coding It Forward. So this was uh, a project started uh, by students for students. So a number of students uh, are, were interested in using their summer. Uh, uh, students that have skills in, in computer science and software engineering and, and design uh, and, and a number of other areas <coughs> and are interested in working in the federal government. Uh, and so they launched this project called uh, Coding It Forward, which is is getting thousands of applications at this point for, for students who are interested in taking what they've learned um, in disciplines like CS and design and, and applying them to important uh, public and societal challenges. Um, our work was not just limited to the natural sciences and engineering. So uh, we also did some work in the uh, social and behavioral sciences. So. 
um, the woman in the um, uh, red dress, uh, Maya Shankar, uh, sent me an email uh, and um, said that you know she was interested in working at the White House, and it turned out that um, she had been a child violin prodigy with Itzhak Perlman, uh, had won the major Yale undergraduate awards and was a Rhodes Scholar. So I went out on a limb and decided to take a chance on her. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, what do you want to do? And she said, well, the British have created this behavioral insights team. You know, I think that the US should have something like that. And so in short order, um, she convinced an agency to house the team. She recruited a team of 20, got the president to sign an executive order institutionalizing the team. and launched uh, 60 uh, collaborations uh, with federal departments and agencies, taking advantage of insights from fields like behavioral economics that have the potential to improve public policy, and started this work before uh, her 30th birthday. So, um, so I want to talk a little bit about some of the different uh, tools. So no pressure. <laughs> Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some of the tools that, that we had in order to go from an idea to something happening in the world. Uh, so one uh, was the preparation of the president's budget. Um, so obviously, Congress still has to approve it, but the president's budget is an important starting point for those. So uh, when we had something like the Manufacturing Innovation Institutes that uh, Schroeder worked on, uh, or the President's Brain Initiative that, that required additional funding, um, we would ensure that those things that were priorities were included in the President's budget. We would work with the Congress on legislation. So I, I'll already give you the example of the uh, uh, legislation that gave all agencies the authority to support incentive prizes for up to $50 million, or the Jobs Act that created an IPL on-ramp for emerging growth companies. We tried to identify things that uh, agencies could do with the uh, authority that they already had. Uh, so uh, the international entrepreneur rule is something that the uh, U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services um, uh, had the authority to do, which was, it, which was to use an authority to admit more immigrant entrepreneurs uh, into the United States. The president also had the ability to convene. Um, so if the president had an event and we invited, people generally would rearrange their schedule to come. Uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, a lot of times our uh, communications uh, team would not want to have us invite people too early because then word about what we were doing would leak uh, and they wanted to save the news for the president to announce. So. Uh, we would routinely invite uh, people on a you know Friday afternoon for an uh, over a holiday weekend for an event that was going to occur on Tuesday, uh, and without telling them what the event was going to be about, uh, and they would still come. <laughs> uh, and um, so, the president used that uh, not just to get people to come to a meeting, but to take some action. So a lot of what we did was to build coalitions to advance particular ideas. And then uh, another thing that we could do is to recruit great people. Um, so Schroeder had a big impact in the area of advanced manufacturing. Uh, uh, Maya had a great impact on creating this social and behavioral sciences team. Uh, the US Digital Service was all about recruiting uh, the top talent in the industry to come to the federal government and improve our ability to uh, design uh, and build or, or, or purchase citizen-facing digital services. Um, so these, these are examples of the tools uh, that we had. And the reason I think this is really important is that policymaking is about creating a coherent relationship between ends and means, right? So you have some goal that you're trying to achieve, and then you're trying to figure out what is the thing that the government can do or that we can challenge other people to do that, that will help achieve that goal. So um, we had a, a whiteboard um, that was a collection of, of some of the 
uh, aphorisms uh, that we had developed over time about how to get things done. Um, and I, obviously, I'm not going to go over all of them, but I, I want to talk about one in particular that was one of my favorite thought experiments, which is um, t uh, to imagine that you have a 15-minute uh, meeting uh, with uh, President Obama in the Oval Office. Uh, and um, uh, President Obama says, um, Mr. Barr, um, if you have an idea for you know, policy issue X, uh, um, in order to make your idea, first of all, what is your idea? Why, why are you excited about that idea? In order to make your idea happen, who would I call and what would I ask them to do? Um, so, you know, I, I can, I'll call anyone in the, uh, in the world. It can be a conference call, so there can be more than one person in the line. If it's someone inside the government, like the Treasury Secretary, uh, then I can direct them to do something because I'm their boss. If it's someone outside the government, then I can challenge them to do something. So there were a couple reasons for this thought experiment. One is that uh, psychologists have this concept called agency. Um, and what it means in the, in the, when you're working in the White House is <clears throat> that you have the ability to send uh, the President of the United States a decision memo and have him check the box that says yes, right? So uh, that means that there are more things that, uh, that you see in your environment that you view as potentially changeable uh, because they're the result of human action or inaction as opposed to something fixed like the laws of physics that we really can't do a whole lot about. Um, so you know, how do you give someone else that sense of agency that you as a White House staffer feel? So that, that's one reason. The, <clears throat> the second reason is that uh, if you're trying to do something that is uh, complicated, it's highly likely that uh, you're not going to be able to do that by yourself, but you're going to need to build a coalition. So it's not like there is a single individual out there who will be able to accomplish the goal. Uh, well, it's very difficult to build a coalition if you can't articulate, number one, who are the members of the coalition? And again, it could be entities and individuals both inside and outside the government. And what are the mutually reinforcing steps that you want them to take uh, in order to achieve the goal? So. Uh, if you can say, this is my idea, and in order to make my idea happen, this is who would need to do what, uh, then policymakers are more likely to be responsive. Uh, I had lots of people who would come to my office and say, we, had, we would have some variant of the following conversation. They would say, my issue is important. And I would say, great, like, it, what do you want me to do about it? And they would say, uh, you should make it a priority. <laughs> uh, and so you're far more likely to be, have an impact on, on policy if you can articulate uh, this, so answer this question. In order to make your idea happen, who would you call and what would you ask them to do? And then you can begin to assess uh, to what extent the members of that coalition uh, would be willing and able. Uh, and, and if not, is there something you could do to change that? So. Um, for those of you who are interested in learning a little bit more about some of the other lessons that I learned, I, I wrote an article uh, called Policy Entrepreneurship at the White House, uh, which is about uh, how do you have influence without authority. Uh, that uh, is an open access uh, article, so if you, if you uh, put that into your favorite search engine, um, you should be able to, to locate that. Uh, and with that, uh, I would be uh, delighted to uh, answer any questions um, that you have about uh, science and technology policy. Thank you. Hi, Tom. Uh, Carl Hesch. Um, I'm a first year MPP student here at the Ford School, and I'm also part of the Science and Technology and Public Policy Certificate program. So thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. um, we're gathering our questions, um, but um, I'm going to kick it off with this one. Um, what were some of the biggest barriers you faced in accomplishing your goals um, at the Office of Science and Technology Policy? Well, so one issue is that <clears throat> Our founding fathers came up with this idea of checks and balances. Uh, uh, 
which I now increasingly view as a good thing. <laughs> uh, but you know, when you're in the executive branch, it can be very frustrating if you have an idea and you're unable to convince the Congress uh, that it's a good idea. So one of the ideas that I was excited about and uh, one of my colleagues who eventually became our Deputy Secretary of Education was excited about was uh, to uh, create uh, a DARPA within the Department of Education. So as you know, DARPA was created uh, after Sputnik as, and is invested in things like the internet and stealth technology. Uh, many other agencies lack a similar capability to support high risk, high return research. Uh, and we thought that there was a case for, for doing that uh, in, the, in the Department of Education, given the importance of, of, uh, of education to our, our well-being and to uh, citizenship in the 21st century and, and economic growth. Uh, but we, we were unable to convince uh, the key members of Congress that this was a good idea. So, so uh, that, that's certainly um, w one thing that uh, certainly I understand the, the need to, uh, to have this sort of division of power, but when you're, when you're in the executive branch, it can, it, it can be very frustrating. Thank you for that response, Tom. Uh, my name is Selene. I am a first year MPP uh, with the Ford School and a part of the Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program. Um, I, from the audience, uh, given today's political climate, where do you see opportunities for people who want to affect science and technology policy on a larger scale? Yeah, so um, what, one of the things about science and technology policy is that there's not necessarily this sort of clear career trajectory that exists in, in some other areas. I think one uh, route that a number of people have used is the AAAS uh, S&T Fellowship Program. Um, so that is one mechanism that people have used to sort of get some experience uh, in science and technology policy. Um, and I, I would say um, that the uh, that the administration is taking a fairly hands-off approach with respect to many of the science agencies like the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, there's good work that is continuing to go on in, in the science agencies. Uh, I know that there are some uh, states uh, that are creating uh, fellowship programs uh, at the state level. So I don't, I don't know if Michigan is doing that or, or thinking about doing that, but um, the Moore Foundation, uh, for example, has been supporting a S&T policy fellowship at the, at the state level for both state agencies and the state legislature. Thank you. Um, now we have an intellectual property question. Um, what are your thoughts on companies that buy patents to sue other companies, and how can we reform this system? Uh, well, that, this is not really an area that I am an expert. Um, I know that, um, uh, that the intellectual property is difficult because you're uh, trying to balance competing goals. You know, on the one hand, uh, you want to have sufficient protection of intellectual property so that firms are going to be willing to invest in research and development. Um, I think one problem that we have with our patent system is that um, it's, a, a, it's what's referred to as a unitary system. Um, and I think that leads to some problems. Um, and what I mean by that is that intellectual property plays different roles uh, in different industries. So for example, in the, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, I think you can make a, a much stronger case that in the absence of having this period of exclusivity, a drug company is not going to invest $2 billion in uh, getting a, a new drug candidate all the way through uh, uh, clinical trials in the absence of exclusivity. In other industries like IT, they are competing uh, much more on the basis of, of time to market, and IP is used more for defensive purposes rather than anything else. So, you know, I think it's worth exploring uh, whether or not uh, we, we should uh, look at the role that, that IP and patents are playing in different industries and, and being able to have something that is more tailored to the role that IP plays in different sectors. 
Um, earlier today, you mentioned two market-based approaches, uh, SpaceX and NASA, um, and the Inceptive Prize. Um, are there any specific industries that a market-based approach is uniquely suited to advance versus government? Yeah, so um, the, uh, there's a set of tools that the global health community has developed that I think are really interesting and should be used outside the global health uh, community. So they have had to uh, deal with the following challenge, which is that there are uh, innovations in global health that have a high social return and a low private return. A canonical example of this is vaccines for diseases of the poor. Left to their own devices, drug companies won't work on vaccines for poor people. So an economist by the name of Michael Kramer came up with a clever solution for dealing with this problem, which is known as an advanced market commitment. So this is essentially the, the governments or other uh, uh, philanthropists uh, saying to the, to the drug industry, if you develop a vaccine which is safe and effective, then we will purchase X million doses at Y dollars per dose. Um, and so the reason that finance ministers really like this idea is that had the drug companies not delivered, the governments would have been out zero dollars, right? So the, the way the federal government is currently set up, uh, we, uh, it, the government tends to make financial commitments that are contingent on failure. So we have $2.6 trillion of loan guarantees on the federal books. So that's the government saying, if you go bankrupt, then Uncle Sam is good for it. With this advanced market commitment, the government is making a financial commitment that is contingent on success, right? Saying, hey, if you develop a vaccine, which is safe and effective, then we'll buy it. So I think we should be doing a lot more of that. But what it requires is the capacity to do three things. One is to identify an unmet need. Uh, you know, in the case of a vaccine, it's like, a million kids under the age of five die every year from a vaccine preventable disease. No vaccine currently exists, so that's the unmet need. The second is to develop a performance-based specification. So again, the government is not saying, it's not dictating the how, it's just uh, describing the what. So in the drug industry, for example, this is called a target product profile. This is a description of what it would mean for there to be a safe and effective vaccine. And then the third thing is, if there's a market failure, if there's a large gap between the social return and the private return, then what type of incentive uh, would be necessary to get the private sector to work on, on this problem? So again, that approach is not gonna work in all instances, but in, particularly in those areas where, where um, you can uh, have a reasonably clear definition of the problem and what an effective solution would look like, uh, using these approaches like incentive prizes or milestone payments or advanced market commitments may be one way of addressing those. Um, next question is, in terms of long-term security and stability specific to global competition and national security, how do we weigh risks in the speed and open accessibility of emerging technologies while still attempting to maintain our position as a global leader? Very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think one thing is uh, that you, when you are uh, uh, dealing with emerging technologies, uh, to say, to really think at the beginning about what the risks uh, could be as associated with these. Um, and in some cases, uh, you know, that may lead to uh, some selective departures from, um, uh, open publishing. And so an, an example of this is that there was a big debate um, uh, in, uh, in biomedical research associated with something called gain of function. So uh, for example, if you're trying to understand uh, why a virus uh, you know, uh, or a bacteria would be more virulent, um, what, you know, on the one hand, you want to understand what those mechanisms are so that you can be on the lookout for that. But on the other hand, if you like just publish that, uh, then there is the risk that that knowledge could be um, misused. So I do think that there are some instances um, that uh, the National Academy of Sciences called experiments of concern, where there are clearly dual use 
uh, applications associated with these and that you may need to have a review process either before the research is funded uh, or certainly before the research is, uh, is, is published. Uh, we just saw an instance of an organization doing this voluntarily. So OpenAI um, uh, published some results on the use of natural language processing to uh, generate fake news. And they said, we're not going to publish the algorithm. We're going we're to publish, um, you know, uh, we're, we're going to describe the results and we're going to go around and brief policymakers so that they have some sense for this, how this technology is occurring. Another example of a regime or a set of norms that the research community has come up with is if you, dis if you identify a vulnerability associated with you know, an operating system or, or, or some other form of information technology, let the vendor know, uh, give them an opportunity to fix it before publishing it so that you don't uh, have, a, have a situation of, of zero day exploits. So, these are you know, examples of an effort to uh, balance some of these considerations, but I, it is a, a really important area. And, and unfortunately, there's no set of principles that you can articulate that will allow you to figure out what the right thing to do is. And reasonable people, people will disagree about where you should draw the line, uh, number one. And number two, uh, we will inevitably be surprised uh, so we, we may be able to come up with some examples of um, you know, how this technology will be both uh, used and, and misused, but uh, I think a certain amount of uh, humility is needed because we'll, uh, we might have some theories, but we will inevitably be surprised by, by what happens in the real world. So great, great question. Thank you. Um, in the last couple of months, we've seen um, a growing um, cybersecurity breaches, uh -huh. uh, Facebook's Cambridge Analytica, and the deterioration yep. of data privacy. Mm -hmm. um, what is the role of policymakers and the federal government um, in ensuring that uh, this doesn't happen again, if any, or do we expect Facebook to self-regulate? Yeah, so uh, certainly other countries are not taking that approach. So that is not the approach that uh, the European Union is is uh, taken. So they have launched uh, comprehensive privacy regulation through something called the GDPR. Um, and uh, I th another thing that people have looked at is increasing the uh, the potential sanctions that are associated with uh, various data breaches. Um, so you know one way to get companies to do less of something uh, is to increase the the penalties that are associated with that, um, at, a, at a minimum, um, to um, to ensure that they have a duty to disclose when there when there has been a, a data breach. Um, so, um, I think that the uh, pendulum is beginning to shift with uh, with more companies actually saying there there probably needs to be a national uh, you know privacy uh, framework. Uh, and in part, what they're interested in heading off is having each of the 50 states have their own state level uh, privacy legislation that would make things a lot more difficult for them. Uh, we've seen um, in, as uh, technologies emerge and as big data increases that um, vulnerable populations can be disproportionately affected. Um, yeah. How did your office prioritize or consider these effects on vulnerable populations and how can we do better moving forward? Yeah. Um, so um, we issued s several reports looking at the uh, interaction between uh, uh, big data, uh, machine learning, uh, and privacy and civil liberties and, and vulnerable populations. Um, and uh, let, let me give you one example um, that people are concerned about. So as many of you know, the way uh, these recent advances in machine learning have occurred is that algorithms are trained rather than programmed. Uh, so if we want an algorithm to be able to distinguish between a cat and a dog, uh, we, we give the algorithm lots of uh, examples of labeled training data. Uh, and it, uh, uh, in, in one case, you know, forms this uh, network uh, that is constantly adjusting the weights uh, between the nodes in the network until it does 
a highly accurate job of mapping between an input and an output. So one thing that people have noticed is that uh, if the training data itself is reflects existing biases, then um, then audit you know algorithmic decision making can reinforce uh, those biases. So there's now a active research community um, called uh, Fairness, Accountability, and Transparency uh, that is uh, trying to address these issues at the design stage. So uh, the, uh, the research community is not saying, oh, this is someone else's responsibility. They're saying we should be ad addressing these issues uh, head on and are generating research results to both understand if these biases exist, and, but also to come up with some mechanisms for addressing them. Many uh, science and technology policy scholars worry that the decentralized nature of science and technology policy has resulted in a um, research uh, system that provides good support for research, but doesn't always connect uh, set research to social outcomes. For example, uh, great medical research, but lack of access to high tech care. Mm -hmm. How can we do a better job of innovating for the public good? It's a great question. Um, so. One of my concerns is that the ability of different federal departments and agencies to interact with the research community varies widely across uh, the federal government. So there are five agencies uh, that account for roughly 90% of the federal R&D budget, and that's the Department of Defense, NIH, uh, Department of Energy, NASA, and the National Science Foundation. So. Um, Agencies that have the responsibility for worrying about the bottom half of the income distribution, uh, so agencies like HUD or the human services parts of HHS or the Department of Labor uh, have little or no capacity to interact uh, with the research community. Uh, and so as uh, I think an interesting thought experiment is to imagine that one of those agencies had a research arm uh, and ask, uh, number one, what goals would it set? And number two, what are examples of projects that it would support in order to achieve those goals? So uh, we just put out a, uh, w working with the, uh, a nonprofit organization called uh, Jobs for the Future, um, a call for ideas uh, for what we're calling a unicorn for the middle class. So as you know, uh, in Silicon Valley, the status symbol is a startup that has a market cap of a billion dollars. We challenge people to come up with ideas that would increase the incomes of 100,000 non-college educated workers by $10,000. Uh, so that, that would get you, that's a unicorn for the middle class. So there are certain types of research questions uh, that are not even being asked because uh, there's no private sector incentive to invest in these, number one. And number two, the relevant part of the federal government, the relevant mission agency, like the Department of Labor, for example, <laughs> has limited or essentially no capacity to interact with the research community uh, and think about science and technology as one of the potential tools. So for example, if you, get, if you talk to people about housing policy, uh, you'll get into a discussion about uh, zoning uh, and, um, uh, and you know, uh, building additional public uh, housing or, uh, you know, uh, uh, or subsidies or something like that. The way an engineer would think about that problem is, well, how could you make the house itself less expensive, right? Now that might not be the right answer, but it's at least, my view is that it's at least one of the ideas that ought to be considered when we're thinking about uh, solving some of these problems. And because of this imbalance, um, so a lot of these questions are, are not even being asked. And so I actually think there's a role for for research universities uh, to, you know, go to their alumni and say, hey, you know, we think there's an opportunity here. The federal government isn't immediately going to fund this, uh, but we have an opportunity to like demonstrate what might be possible if we made this societal goal an, an active area of research. What differences have you found in your ability to shape or impact SNT policy from OSTP versus a philanthropy like Schmidt Futures? 
Yeah, so um, the, the federal government has a different scale. Uh, so uh, one of the things that I worked on uh, for uh, President uh, Clinton was the launch of something called the National Nanotechnology Initiative. And this has resulted in a cumulative investment of $23 billion in nanoscale science and engineering. So the federal government has an, has an opportunity to operate at a, at a scale that is different uh, from, uh, from private philanthropy. Um, now, um, the advantage of private philanthropy is greater flexibility and speed. Um, so someone who is working for a philanthropist uh, does not have to get uh, 60 votes in the United States Senate. Uh, so, uh, so that, I think, allows a philanthropist to respond more rapidly to emerging uh, challenges and, and opportunities. Uh, but pr uh, private philanthropy is in no way a, a substitute uh, for federal investment in in, in science and technology uh, because of the, I think, ne necessity to have, um, you know, democratic voice in, uh, in public priorities and just the diff different scale that the federal government operates. You know, the, execu the executive branch uh, agencies have a total budget of, a, of $4 trillion. So that's not something that is going to be replaced by private philanthropy. From our viewers on uh, the live stream and Twitter, um, how can we filter fact from fiction, fake news, information in this world of mass data and communications? Any advice? <laughs> 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 oh, I got an algorithm on my, I'll, I'll, I'll email it to you. Um, I, you know, there are um, a number of interesting experiments that are going on. So one is, uh, one experiment that I'm aware of, for example, is, is trying to l leverage training uh, in critical thinking and crowdsourcing. So uh, training people in, in critical thinking and the ability to um, you know, tag or identify uh, weaknesses uh, in, uh, uh, in, in arguments um, and just training a lot of people to do that. Um, so I, I don't think that you know, there's going to be a, uh, a quick uh, technical fix uh, to this. Uh, but I, I think it is an, is an active area of, of research. Uh, and, you know, I have to say that, um, that in, the, in the 90s, um, I was really excited about this idea that, uh, that we were going to have, uh, you know, the, uh, the equivalent of a printing press and a radio station and a TV station for, uh, for everyone who is, like, connected to the Internet. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think I'm now more aware of, of, of uh, some of the challenges that that, that poses. What advice would you give for people not working in scientific fields who want to affect change? Um, it, so, you know, uh, uh, Dean Barr will tell you that uh, that effective public policy requires people coming together with lots of different skills. Um, so you know, I just talked about this this idea of advanced market commitments. That that's an idea that came out of the the economics profession. Um, the um, the uh, you know whole idea of of taking insights from behavioral economics and applying them to public policy. Um, the idea of mechanism design, uh, which has been used to reduce the waiting line for a kidney transplant. So lots of different disciplines have the uh, ability to contribute to uh, public policy. <clears throat> the other thing is that you need people who can help translate between scientists and engineers and policymakers and, and the public. So uh, many times scientists and engineers are not particularly good at explaining the importance of what it is that they're working on. Uh, and, and having people who can understand uh, what, they're, what they're doing and why it's important, but still have the ability to communicate with the public can play a really important role. Um, we talked about the rise of AI and machine learning, and we know that it's growing at a very rapid pace. Yes. Um, there is contention within the public and the American system currently that um, robots are going to replace 
people in the workforce? Um, kind of how do you quell those, those I guess, specific myths? Um, and what role do, will robots have um, in the workplace in the coming future? Yeah, so um, some of the analysis that has uh, been done is an effort um, to try to address that question at the level of tasks rather than jobs. So to say, what are the tasks that, that, uh, that people are currently engaged in and which of those tasks are susceptible to automation? Um, and some of the analysis that's been done, I think, is uh, concerning for, for, particularly for non-college educated workers. So, so it's not to say that everyone uh, will, will not be affected by this at, uh, at some level, but it'd be, I think, particularly hard for, uh, for non-college educated workers. So I, I think that's an area that deserves a lot more attention. Um, the United States is uh, near the bottom uh, when it comes to public sector investment as a share of GDP in what economists call active labor market policies. So this is things like help with job search and, uh, and job training and, and reskilling. So I think that's uh, definitely an area that needs a lot more investment. Uh, but we need to figure out how to make that effective. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think, I wouldn't be in favor of just, you know, throwing a bunch more money at the current system. I, I think we got to look at the workforce development system and, and figure out how to make it more effective. Uh, because I think in many cases, there are not very strong connections between training providers and employers. So the training providers are, are running someone through a program, but there's no guarantee that they're going to get a job at the other end. So I think we have to ensure that, um, that the workforce development system is a lot more demand driven th than it currently is. To, to build off that question, how can the U.S. government better serve tech companies through H-1 visa reform or improvements? Yeah, I don't necessarily think it needs to be done through H-1Bs. Um, so I think one of the problems with the H-1B is that it creates um, uh, an unequal power dynamic between the employer and the employee. So uh, uh, President Obama had a number of proposals to uh, just increase the number of green cards for highly skilled workers. Um, so one of the ways that you can do that is to have every visa um, that you're providing not only cover uh, the worker, uh, but his or her family. So that's one way of, of, of doing that. So um, I think there are ways to increase. Um, so the, you know, the problem with the uh, H-1B visa program is that it's A, it's temporary, uh, and B, that um, it creates this unequal power dynamic between employer and employee. So uh, when we looked at this issue, our, our view was just to increase the number of, of green cards uh, and also make it easier for uh, graduate students uh, who, are, who are getting a, a STEM degree. If, if they want to stay in the United States, uh, we, should, uh, we should staple a green card to their diploma and not force them to go overseas if they want to stay in the United States. Uh, during your tenure at OSTP, what uh, was involved in initiatives to ensure the public has free, open access to outputs of scientific research? What do you think is the role of government in promoting open access to knowledge? And what is the role of foundations like Smith Futures? Sure. Um, so there had been a policy uh, that the NIH uh, and Congress pushed, which basically said, <clears throat> if, you're get it, if you're taking federal money for your research, uh, then the publication should be open access within a year. Um, and so we, got, we extended that policy to uh, the other major science agencies. So that was one thing that we did. And the second thing that we did to say that this policy should not just apply to um, the publication, but to the underlying data. Um, now, you know, that's been more difficult. Uh, the publications is, is a lot more straightforward. Uh, so agencies are taking steps in this direction, but that's, that's an area where I think we have a lot more work to do. Uh, and I think that the case for doing this is even stronger uh, given advances in machine learning, because what machine learning in, certainly if you're talking about supervised machine learning is driven by uh, access to data. And so if, if we make that data available, uh, and we make it reusable, 
um, that, that's going to accelerate the pace of scientific research. This will be our last question. Um, in working in S&T policy, how important are soft skills, um, including communication and team building, uh, compared to scientific literacy? Uh, very important, yeah. <clears throat> so, um, the, uh, you know, so some of the important soft skills, as I said, are the ability to communicate across the technical, non-technical, um, you know, divide. I, th I think that's one. The second is um, <clears throat> the ability to build coalitions. Uh, you know, there are very few things that you do by yourself that you, requires eliciting collaboration and cooperation uh, between pe uh, f uh, with, with people that do not work for you or do not report to you. So the ability to do that is really important. The ability to develop uh, relationships that are based on trust, uh, mutual understanding, and reciprocity. So it w I would not be effective if I was constantly sending a one-sided stream of requests from me to other people in the, in the federal government. It would be like if you had a friend when you only heard from them when, when they needed help moving. <laughs> it would, get, it would like get old after a while. Um, so one of the things I would do is I would have coffee or dinner or drinks uh, with people to try to understand what it is that they were trying to accomplish and how I could help them. So it was not just sort of like me constantly calling up, up and saying, hey, you know, can you do X, Y, and Z? So um, I think that those skills are, are very important and there were you know, a number of brilliant scientists uh, in the federal government um, who I think had challenges because they were less strong uh, in, in, in some of those areas. Uh, and so as a result, we're, we're less effective. So, uh, and if the, uh, the piece that I wrote on uh, policy entrepreneurship um, t talks about what some of the skills that are, that are particularly helpful. Um, that's really great, Tom. And, um I'm not sure whether this is working, but uh, we can also get, I think, that uh, article around for people to see. Maybe we'll post it on the website as well. Um, please join me in thanking um, Tom.